Welcome to ATCM, the emergency medicine channel. A 58 year old male presented to ER with complaints of right lower limb pain and swelling since 4 days. On initial 10 second assessment, airway was patent, no pooling of secretions, respirator rate was 18 per minute, saturation 98 percentage on room air. Uh, coming to circulation, BP was 140 bar 90 millimeters of mercury, pulse rate 98 per minute, all peripheral pulsations equally felt in all 4 limbs. Disability GCS was 15 by 15, pupils equal and reacting to light. Coming to exposure, the temperature was 100.5 degree Fahrenheit and GRBS was 230 milligram per deciliter and pain score was 4 by 10. So, at that point of time, we have given one injection PCM, 1 gram IV stat. Coming to history, patient who is a non-case of diabetes meritus hypertension on treatment presented with complaints of right lower limb swelling and pain since 3 days. Swelling was initially over right ankle and then uh, there was associated redness and pain over the side. The redness and swelling was progressively increasing upwards till uh, below the knee. There was associated fever and rigor since 2 days. No history of any trauma to the ankle, immobilization, surgery or shortness of breath. No history of any blackish discoloration of the skin, uh, any unknown bite or joint pains. No history of decreased urine output or similar episodes in the past. Uh, coming to examination, patient was conscious oriented, uh, no pallor sinosis, clubbing lymphadenopathy, right lower limb edema was there and yes. coming to local examination, redness was present over the right ankle extending up to tibial tuberosity, local rise of temperature was there, all pulse, peripheral pulses was palpable bilaterally, there were no lymph nodes, capillary refilling time was normal, uh, there was no restriction of movement uh, and weight bearing was present and systemic examination were within normal limit. So, we had taken a VBG showing pH of 7.352, potassium 3.8, sodium 129, lactates 1, creatine 0 0.96, spicarbonate of 20, total counts of 13,000, uh, hemoglobin 12, platelet of 2,38,000 and CRP was 100. So, uh, at this point of time, we had a differential diagnosis of uh, one cellulitis or it can be a DVT with unilateral lymphedema. Um, so, we had started on injection of fluoxacin, mm. 1 okay. gram. So, so, it's a straightforward. So, I wanted to know what are the, uh, you said there is no trauma history. No trauma. So, comorbidities, diabetes, diabetes, hypertension, hypertension. no diabetes. Di diabetes is there. Diabetes, diabetes is, is there with hypertension. Any uh, animal bite history, it is not there. Okay. Any uh, contamination, history of contamination with any exposure to seawater? Uh, no, sir. Chronic liver disease? No. Uh, fresh water contamination? No, sir. Nothing is there. Like you do, we have to ask uh -huh. this history. See, what we are doing here is we are having a soft tissue infection. So, that is the first thing. Okay. So, soft tissue infection, how can you classify different soft tissue infections? Uh, superficial. Uh -huh, that is not superficial ending. That is very easy to say. It is not superficial ending. We have to say whether it is an impetigo, whether it is an FC pellas, whether it is a cellulitis whether it is a necrotizing fasciitis. So, these are the four possible soft tissue infection. Then you can have paniculitis, folliculitis and all. That is a generalized area. So, our aim is to whether to differentiate between any of the soft tissue infection. So, first of all, let's come to impetigo. So, uh, impetigo, what are the different types of impetigo that you know of? Have you heard of a terminology called as impetigo? Yes, it is again a skin infection caused by gram positive organisms again. So, you can have bullous impetigo and non bullous impetigo. So, bullous impetigo, the classically there will be fluid swelling, large swelling, which we had seen just now for a patient right now in the ED. So, that is a large fluid filled space collection will be there, usually by gram positive organism. Again, staph is the most one of the most common organism for a bullous impetigo. Then we can have non bullous impetigo. We can have small crusting sort of a thing. It can even happen in the angle of the mouth and all. So, that is called non bullous impetigo. So, that is again a soft tissue infection. Then the classical erysipelas. So, erysipelas I think 3-4 days back we had one patient. Uh, again, uh, we got admitted in ID department. So, it will be an angry looking swelling, strawberry red in color and superficially it will be too much. The classical that angry looking patient, uh, uh, the infection will be uh, bright red in color. So, that is a classical erysipelas. Again, streptococcal infection. Then you have the this category of patient where cellulitis, if it goes to a systemic infection like sepsis and all, we call it as necrotizing fasciitis, where you'll have necrosis, the black discoloration and all those things. So cellulitis, again you can grade them into 
class 1 class 2 class 3 and class 4 class 1 just like what you have said only there is some local infection class 2 there is, will be some comorbidities maybe we can put him in class 2 group because he has diabetes and he might be little bit systemically unwell like high temperature uh, febrile all those things whatever you have suggested then you go to the class 3 where another organism function slight organism functions have developed and the patient might be going for a sepsis sort of a situation and class 4 is classical sepsis and multi-organ dysfunction septic shock and all those things so these are how will you classify your cellulitis so what you have to say here here he is having probably a class 2 cellulitis at present okay then the final one will be your necrotizing fasciitis so necrotizing fasciitis it's very clear uh, what all things you have you can either the class 4 cellulitis can go into a necrotizing fasciitis there will be necrosed tissue blackish discoloration all those things it will be rapidly progressing and patient will be quite systemically unwell so that is necrotizing fasciitis again you can classify necrotizing fasciitis again depending upon uh, their uh, presentation depending upon your crp above like 150 total count about 15000 high creatine low sodium there are different criteria you can differentiate different types of necrotizing fasciitis but generally necrotizing fasciitis means the patient is sick and uh, he will be in sepsis so whether you can still categorize them into different groups that's what i said we can put zero onto there are a lot of scoring system what i am sending is just from rcm learning i have not taken any other resources this is just from royal college of emergency medicine you can just go to rcm learning what all is there it is there only so that is how you have to differentiate between them now as you said differential diagnosis you can have to think about non-infectious and infectious differential diagnosis so you said regarding dvt but most unlikely to be a dvt because there is a tenderness there is a local rise of temperature and there is no history of immobilization but we can rule out maybe you can just take a doppler to rule out but you have some problems then you go for a uh, <coughs> doppler study but generally it is not required uh, but whenever you have doubt like an elderly male uh, who has been bedridden for uh, some days you think it, there is redness there is tenderness you have some dilemma whether to take it crp might be elevated in both the conditions also tc also will be elevated so we have some doubt in our mind okay fine then we can go ahead and do a doppler but generally what investigation is required is basically how much is the infection has progressed whether any organ dysfunction has happened or not that is the only investigation that is required initially and maybe a proper sterile swab also you can take uh, but general recommendation is not need to take unless and until uh, you are suspecting an MRSA. The patient is coming from uh, a hospital or even community acute MRSA we are seeing these days. And uh, specifically when one of us develop a skin infection, we have to definitely think of MRSA. And uh, what will you do when you, uh, you have an MRSA outbreak in your ICU or whether how will you prevent MRSA outbreak? What is the prophylaxis? What we need to do? How does the MRSA carry? It is through the nasal, nasal route. So, what is the treatment? It is the mipirocin. Mipirocin ointment, you can ask them to apply in the nasal cavity. So, once there is an MRSA outbreak or you are exploring, if seeing a patient with MRSA, you need you can just apply some mipirocin ointment uh, in the nasal cavity. And hand washing is the most important thing. So, that is regarding your uh, four different types. That is impetigo, erysipelas, cellulitis and necrotizing facial. It is a soft tissue infection. Now let's come to the uh, treatment aspect. Treatment aspect is simple, pain management you need to give, hypotension, organ dysfunction management, all those things you need to do. Mostly the, in, uh, the question that I have asked here, whether there was any sea water, animal bite, fresh water, all those things is very very important because it's not the normal organism that you will see in this group of patients. So we had, uh, we always used to discuss whenever you have a CLD patient, chronic liver disease with seawater, seawater, history of contact with the seawater, we need to think of Vibrio vulnificus. So that is very common, uh, when once you know only you will explore that. So Vibrio vulnificus, the treatment you have to give Puracil Desobactum. So Vibrio vulnificus, it is a rapidly progressing necrotizing fasciitis and patient will die within 48 hours if you are not treating them properly. So it's an acute presentation, so that is Vibrio vulnificus. So, Vibrio vulnificus. Then there are other anaerobic organisms like in pastoral species when you have a cat bite. So, pastoral species you need to think. Then you have freshwater, you have other group of organism. Then animal bites always, whether it's a dog bite, it's a cat bite. Every time you need to think there is an anaerobic infection is also there. Because 
their oral cavity whatever be the organism in the oral cavity will be contaminated into that wound so that is the reason whenever we have a tooth infection we will give anaerobic coverage similarly an animal bite animal will have lot of anaerobes in their mouth so that can get transmitted to the skin and we need to give an anaerobic coverage whenever you are suspecting an animal bite see generally an augmented amoxicillin clavulanic acid is the recommended choice for animal bites rabbit whatever be it because a lot of pet people are carrying uh, rabbit these days so whatever be the thing uh, augmented is the choice it has got anaerobic coverage but you won't have a specific much more because there is a necrotic patch and all you can think of adding clindamycin also so that is the uh, two differences that you need to do now coming to the antibiotics therapy that what you need to start off with what you said is 100% on flucloxacillin is the treatment of choice if you are suspecting an mrsa you need to add a drug which has got an mrsa coverage so that is the most important thing that you need to cover maybe linazolid or maybe vancomycin but linazolid is a preferred agent again for the skin infection linazolid you need to cover for mrsa group of organisms so uh, then coming to uh, whether we need to start clindamycin so coming to the drug clindamycin clindamycin is a drug which has got very good anaerobic coverage very good gram positive coverage and it has also got a property called as what anti toxin effect so majority of the infection may be viral uh, bacterial infection but there will be some toxins also produced from this bacteria so that clindamycin has got this anti toxin effect also so that will help to improve the infection much more faster then the question arises whom should we take for debridement so no doubt systemically unwed class 3 and class 4 class 4 definitely and necrotizing fasciitis the source control is the key so without doing the source control you are not going to save the patient without just giving giving antibiotics it is not going to help so definitely surgical debridement or maybe amputation depending upon how severe it is the infection you need to think about doing that and mostly the patient will deteriorate very very rapidly especially in necrotizing fasciitis and all if you are not doing a source control within next 24 hours the patient will definitely go into an cardiac arrest so uh, that is the worst outcome that the patient can have renal failure all those things they will start developing and once the sepsis septic shock all those things we just manage like any other sepsis patient but mostly the key thing in any sepsis management is the source control if you are not removing that collection then the patient is not going to improve whatever the necrotic tissue we need to remove and uh, do that everything okay so uh, what has been done to this patient you started on flucloxacillin he was admitted patient hmm. and um, we had given a patient was admitted and uh, general surgery and they were uh, doing regular dressings with magnesium sulfate and everything and patient was improved what dressing again the question arises what dressing is needed for a cellulitis max Huh? Saline dressing. Or saline saline dressing. You are giving systemic antibiotics, mm -hmm. but when you have just eris, I said regarding impetigo, just localized impetigo, maybe mupirosin will be more than enough. When you wanted a systemic antibiotic, uh, like cellulitis and all, ideally you don't need any other uh, other dressing. So just you need to ask, maybe uh, need to keep that uh, limb, maybe rest for another two to three days, proper DVT prophylaxis. and just a uh, limb rise will be more than enough and uh, magnesium sulfate why we have found of is magnesium sulfate will decrease the edema a little bit faster that was the only reason and no need of any other fancy dressing nothing else is needed a soft roll maybe a k bandage and uh, you can apply and little bit of offloading the patient should not be walking because if that walk it will might take but you can keep that open also if there is no other uh, contamination and all you can keep that open and always keep in your mind there is a possibility of gram negative infections also mostly it is gram positive but the patient is there in the hospital for a long time uh, again you need to sometimes very rarely we can have a gram negative also but mostly it is a gram positive with anaerobic infection combination is what we need to expect uh, in a skin infection so uh, anything else that you have prepared and uh, you want to present you can tell mm -hmm. um uh, the differential diagnosis and yes. the receptor labs there were borders will be distinct mm. bright red so from that we can uh, differentiate from cellulitis mm. and uh, ne necrotizing fasciitis the main sig um, uh, significance will be the uh, pain which is out of proportion of the examination then toxic shock syndrome it can cause hypotension or organ failure uh, gas gangrene is also rapidly progressing severe muscle pain will be there crepitus or bodily can also be present uh, then skin abscess there will be fluctuant uh, mass 
then myositis is a dd and causing localized muscle pain muscle pain, pain. okay so uh, can you just tell the dose of fluclocoxacillin and clindamycin so that uh, audience fluclocoxacillin 1 gram iv q6 hourly mm. and uh, clindamycin 600 mg uh, iv q uh, mid tad or bd tad tad or bd tad is minimum that what we need to start Q. off with and linosolid bd bd you have to 600 mg bd you need to start off metronidazole generally not preferred for skin infection okay. so metronidazole you give it for your gi infection so okay. inside the abdomen you can go for metronidazole for anaerobic coverage for skin clindamycin and chest also clindamycin is the agent of choice so and again regarding one important thing is tetanus so there can be associated tetanus because the patient might not be taken adequate maybe he had a small uh, wound on that he can we had a patient who long back like not very really long back like 5 6 years back who had a trivial trauma it was not uh, kept uh, kept uh, cleaned uh, for a long time and he developed tetanus so uh, what will be the classical finding of tetanus hydrophobia hydrophobia log jo spasms the log jo then the classical ophisthotonus but we might not be able to see the classical ophisthotonus unless and until it is very evident but uh, this log jo uh, everything will be uh, able to see in tetanus and how will you treat tetanus how so specifically when a patient comes with trauma how will you decide okay this patient needs tetanus vaccine or this patient needs a tetanus immunoglobulin how will you decide uh, whether it is clean or contaminated wound. okay Uh, if it is clean wound and the uh, tt was taken within 3 years uh, only 3 uh, years see first of all you need to ask for the vaccination history majority of the time they will not be very sure but uh, usually school children till 15 years of age they will be covering but after that adult vaccination we are not regularly taking so uh, usually tetanus 5 years is what they said but sometimes majority of the time we will have got immunity but what all injuries need a tetanus prophylaxis as you said tetanus prone wound contaminated wound with soil so that is a classical is a contaminated wound rta which is kind of a lot of contamination mud and all those things is definitely it's a tetanus prone wound a wound that has been kept open for more than 6 hours not dressed the patient had some injury it was kept open for 6 hours and uh, he had been traveling and coming to you so these are the classical tetanus prone wound whatever we say regarding tetanus the general public will think that the rust injury all those things they think tetanus and they will come to us to take a tt so this is a classical tetanus prone wounds are these two things now we have to assess vaccination status of the patient whether it is a tetanus prone wound or it is a non tetanus prone wound so that is our decision if you know clearly vaccination everything done it is an on tetanus prone nothing need to be done vaccination is still unknown but it is again a non tetanus prone wound but if the patient is not clear you can give one tetanus booster dose at that time tetanus prone wound or whether the vaccination history is not known with the tetanus prone wound the patient is coming to you so with the patient is coming to you if he is fully vaccinated just booster is enough but otherwise if it is tetanus prone wound not taken back you have to give immunoglobulin 250 international unit that is the prophylaxis of prevention of tetanus now once you start treating tetanus you have to start treating tetanus you have to give like very high doses of tetanus immunoglobulin we have to give like 1000 1500 we have to calculate body weight per kg and we need to give higher doses of tetanus immunoglobulins and then you need to start with metronidazole or clindamycin or penicillin so this will be the agents that you need to start for tetanus. tetanus so tetanus again prophylaxis also very important you need to recognize that this patient is going for a proper tetanus and the most injury it will be a trivial trauma unnoticed trauma so that history whenever you have a patient coming to the ed with log jo the stiffness and all those things always ask for the any history of trauma is there in the past so two patients whatever he had tetanus they had this so later on uh, uh, but they were not suspecting tetanus but we thought it is certain and treated them and they recovered and said they will have a lot of spasms so we need to give benzodiazepines so for that reason airway management is a very difficult choice but surgical airway might be required but both these patient were managed without any uh, mechanical ventilation we just uh, treated with tetanus immunoglobulin and uh, antibiotics all those um, recovered so that is again cellulitis but any trauma vision you need to think about this uh, tetanus prophylaxis also okay